So, um, yeah, let's, let's take a look at the slides. I won't leave them up there all the time, um, but let's go ahead and take a look at the slides. Real quickly about me, for those of you that I haven't met yet. Um, so I've been at this for a little while. Uh, I am at 35 years of uh, information technology, product development, management, leadership, uh, you name it. I've kind of been involved in a lot of different things over the last many years. Um, some of you know, I spent uh, some of those years at Siemens Medical in the Philadelphia area. Um, I left Siemens in 2008 and have been running my own company since, focusing on exactly this type of thing. Uh, training, coaching, consulting, uh, anything that I can do. My, my goal is to uh, help people and companies work better together, right? Um, one of the things that I noticed when I left Siemens, for example, uh, and it's not just a Siemens thing, so I'm not trying to pick on, on any particular company, but uh, we were stressed. Big time, okay. Uh, a lot of things happening that um, I think we could have done better. And, and I have not only learned better ways to do them, but I've been teaching those ways uh, to a lot of other companies across this planet for the last, oh my, uh, 14, 15 years now. Uh, so you can see on the slide there, I've got 19 years of experience in agile development coaching and training. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to uh, be able to offer my training in over 20 countries across three continents. Uh, I have been places and seen and met people I never ever thought I would have the advantage uh, and the pleasure to, to meet and see. Uh, more than a thousand training sessions, more than 16,000 students. In fact, I'm probably gonna have to check that count sometime soon. We might be hitting 17,000 soon. Um, and, and to me, I look at that as lives touched uh, any way that I can help. And for a lot of you that I have directly coached or trained, um, you know, and I make this offer to everybody, um, uh, here's my email address, right? I'm going to pop it right here into the chat window. There you go. If you have a question uh, after, the, after the webinar, at any time after the webinar, that's how you reach me. Um, I usually respond pretty quickly. Uh, sometimes I'm delayed. Uh, because I'm teaching, but that's the only thing that's really going to slow me down. Um, so, wow, we have more than, we have 30 people on board, which is very cool. Thank you again, everybody, for coming. Um, so, yeah, the rest of this uh, on this slide, you can see pretty well. You don't need me reading it to you. Uh, so let's get into the real meat of this. Um, there we go. So some topics for you. Number one, why do we slice stories, right? That's the first thing I want to cover briefly. Um, and then I want to get into one of the biggest problems I see with user story slicing, because before we start talking about how to do it, it's probably a good idea to talk about how not to do it. And that is what we call horizontal versus vertical slicing. Um, there's a, a section on, of course, that's the big section. What are the effective approaches to uh, slicing up a user story? And where can you learn more? So I have a little tiny bit at the very, very end where I'm gonna show you how you can learn more about, uh, about writing user stories, slicing user stories, managing user stories, and so on. Uh, one quick note for those of you that are in um, the uh, ACSM, uh, the Advanced CSM program with Artisan, uh, this webinar counts as one hour toward your coaching requirement. So for those of you that are in that program, you know what I'm talking about. And for those of you that aren't, uh, hey, feel free. You've got my email address, reach out and I'll tell you all about it, okay? Um, all right, so let's get into uh, the first topic here. Why do we slice backlog items? Uh, and yeah, I'm in a little bit of a hurry because I've got so much information I want to tell you. Um, so if I go too fast, there's a go slower button on the participants window. Uh, at the bottom, it might be under the more button. Uh, just feel free to hit it if, if I'm just speeding long way too fast. Um, so yeah, why do we slice product backlog items? Well. Bottom line is this, when product backlog items are written, they are usually, when they are initially written, they are usually big, okay? Very big. In fact, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard the term epics, okay? Which is not a scrum term, it's actually an extreme programming, an XP term, but hey, who cares, right? It works, but they're big. And when they're big, they're epic sized user stories. Well, they tend to be a lot more expensive to build they create a lot more waste. They create a lot more complexity. They result in a lot more rework. 
They are bottom line riskier. They are just so much harder to build and build safely. Uh, they're just really a bad idea. And in fact, uh, you see the question I have there on the slide. You don't have to answer it, right? It just, just think about it. You'll see what I'm talking about. Which are we more likely to make mistakes when we're building? A backlog item with five test cases or a backlog item with 50 test cases? And I mean, you know the answer to that question, right? Human error is going to pile up when there's that much complexity. So what do we do? We slice these things down before we start planning them and building them. Uh, and yeah, when you've got a backlog item that only has three, four, five test cases, you're going to identify them all and you're going to test them all and you're going to get it right. And you're going to get it right the first time. If you're trying to get 50 test cases, something's going to get missed. Guaranteed, something is going to get missed. All right. Um, so a little insight for you. It's far more effective for a scrum team to work on a lot of little things than a few big things. And I do get pushback on this. Not, it's not uncommon. People will look at me and say, yeah, but a lot of little things, that's a, that's a lot of overhead. That's a lot of slicing and sizing and planning and, and solving and, and on and on and on. Yeah, that's true. That's a lot, but they're very small. And when they're small, they're simple. And when they're simple, solving them, identifying the test cases, building them and getting them right becomes so much easier, okay? So any perceived overhead of having to deal with lots of backlog items disappears when you consider the complexity of a few really, really big backlog items, okay? That's why slicing and doing it right is so important for any Scrum team, really for any team whether you're building a, a software development product, a software product, or you're building a hardware product, or you're writing a book or building a, a procedures manual, breaking it into small little pieces is by far more effective and even more efficient than working with a few really, really big, what I often call rocks or epics. All right. Um, okay. So let's talk about one of the biggest problems, this is the thing that gets in the way of teams all the time. And I apologize, I'm looking around here because I have to reset my windows every time I switch between the slide uh, and me. Um, anyway, so you see on the slide, horizontal slicing versus vertical slicing. Now, first of all, let me explain what's going on here. Let me get myself a, a little pointer that I can use. So these little green blocks, that one and this one, they, they represent the typical application. And, and we don't need to get into arguments about the layers, okay? Um, they're easily transla translatable into whatever system you might be working on. Uh, but they start at the top, if you will, the top with the user interface. And then as we work our way down, there's, there's the, the logic that runs on the client side, like in the browser. There's, there's logic that runs on the server side. So at the app in the cloud or wherever it, it happens to be. There's logic that runs at the data layer to either, either send data out, receive data in, store data, retrieve data. You get the idea. Uh, and then of course we have the architecture, which I apparently can't spell anymore, um, but I'm sure there's enough letters there that you can understand what I mean. Horizontal slicing, uh, as you can see here, is where we cut horizontally across one of those layers. So in other words, I might have a, a backlog item that, that asks me to build the user interface for a certain feature, okay? Um, that's what horizontal slicing means. I, I don't wanna get ahead of myself and tell you why that's a bad idea. We're coming to that. But let's go over to this other drawing here, vertical slicing, same, uh, paradigm, same box, same spelling error, um, but now the arrow goes up and down. So now we're going to slice through the application to build a piece of a feature, which is what I'm going to spend a large portion of the next hour talking about. Okay, but you can see by the little uh, cute little graphics I have on the slide, uh, horizontal slicing, bad idea. Okay, very, very common mistake. In fact, I can tell you stories where I made that one myself way back in history when I was working for Siemens Medical in the Philadelphia area. Um, vertical slicing, great idea, right? Because it allows you to build a little bit of functionality uh, in quick increments. Now, let's get into a little bit more detail of why these are or aren't bad ideas, depending on which one we're talking about. 
So let's look at some examples of horizontal slicing. All right. Um, we're going to build the student roster display screen. So I want you to imagine you're writing software for a university or a college. And a lot of my examples on this webinar follow that paradigm. Um, and we're going to build a, a student roster display for our instructors. So we have this um, we have this backlog item to build the student roster display screen. OK, so we basically build the UI. And when we're done, we have the UI. What does it do? Doesn't do anything. OK, so I don't know if it works. Uh, I could show a picture of it to the customer. But you know what? We've done that before. We put pictures and documents before and they go, yeah, that's OK. And then they start using it. And they go, no, I hate it. OK, the, the, it doesn't do anything. We've sliced horizontally across the user interface and accomplished essentially a wireframe. Can't use it, can't demonstrate it. OK, here's another one. Write the student roster database access routine. Lovely. And when it's done, then what? How do you how do you show it to the customer? How do you demonstrate? Look, this is what it does for us. OK, now, if you want to use the and, and I get I get the uh, the pushback all the time. Well, yeah, but, you know, sometimes you have to rewrite the database access routine to speed things up. Yeah, then you ought to be able to show the student roster display displaying faster. Right. So there's actually something you can show. But if you're building this thing from the very beginning, write the student roster database access routine isn't demonstrable. I can't show that to a customer. I don't know if it's accessing the right data. I don't know if it's accessing it fast enough. I don't know. All I have is something that works. And in the end, I can't deliver it, at least not yet. When we get to vertical slicing, you're going to see some differences in, in what I'm talking about and why these are potentially really bad ideas. Uh, here's another one. Add a hyperlink to the student's name in order to open up the student record. OK. Um, is that really what the instructor wants? I mean, if they said add a hyperlink to the student's name so I can open up the student record, then that one might be OK. But if that's what we're doing, all we're doing is we're just kind of slicing across the UI and saying, oh, yeah, we're going to drop a hyperlink there. You don't I mean, that story by itself isn't really a user story. It doesn't talk about the user. It doesn't tell you why the instructor wants to do that or if that's really what they want to see. It's already a solution. That's a big problem with user stories, and I'll bet you've all seen them. They don't really talk about what the user needs to accomplish. They talk about what we actually are going to build. So we've already skipped a step and gone right to a solution. That's very, very common with horizontal slicing. One more, create the student roster rendering template. So I want you to imagine something that helps the other routines get all the data in the right place on the screen. Again, unless the rest of the functionality is working, that rendering isn't going to tell me anything. Uh, and as a customer, I don't know if I like it because I don't, I can't see it work. I can't tell you if I like it until I see it work. You've, you, you've all had customers like that, you know, the, the, I'll know it when I see it. Okay. Uh, or my favorite, these are the, these are the ones, let me get this out of the way. These are the ones that, um, yeah, I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. Then you finally demonstrate it for them and they go, oh shoot, now that I see it, It'd be really cool if it could, right? If we were going horizontal and, and when we're all done, we can finally demonstrate it to the customer. We could hear the, you know, oh, I, it's, it's, I like it, but it'd be really better if you could do it this way. We're not getting enough feedback. Horizontal slices don't allow us to get feedback. Let me show you what I mean. Go bring up some examples of some vertical slicing. OK, as an instructor, I need a class roster that provides the student ID of every student in my class so that I know who they are, OK? Creates a very simple listing, all right? Student IDs. Now, I'll grant you, student IDs, I, I can't deliver that production. But a vertical slice doesn't always deliver production-ready functionality. It delivers demonstrable production quality functionality. And in other words, Oh, well, I already said another word, so I apologize. I'm, I'm rambling now. But what, what I mean by that is in, in just a few days, we can create a basic listing, nothing fancy, student IDs. We can check the student IDs against the test database to make sure that all the students, in fact, ended up on the list like they were supposed to. 
we can demonstrate it to the customer and say, okay, here's what it's gonna look like roughly. You get the basic idea. Um, you get the basic idea of performance. You get all of that within just a few days of work. Instead of having to wait until all the layers are built, you start to see that vertical functionality right away. Okay, in fact, we might even turn around, uh, I'll give my arrow back here for the annotator. Uh, we might even turn around in the next story and add first and last name. We might even do that in the same sprint, okay? Uh, but I'll tell you what, I'm gonna get the student ID listing working and I'm gonna do something very informal with the stakeholder or the customer and say, here's what we've got in just a few days, what do you think? And if they're good with it, then right into the next story, even in the inside the same sprint, let's go ahead and add first and name first and last name to the class roster. Uh, it adds, as it says, it adds easily readable information that can more importantly be quickly demonstrated. See this, it's all about the feedback. Horizontal slices don't give you the ability to get feedback right away. Vertical slices do. Even if you go back, like the next vertical slice modifies something you built in a previous slice, it's still okay, right? I know that sounds horrible, but it's actually not as bad as it sounds because that feedback is gold. The feedback that we get from our customers and our stakeholders that we get quickly, right? Because we're doing small vertical slices uh, really helps us as we go forward to build the exact right thing the first time. Here's another one. As an instructor, I need to be able to easily access the records of students in my class, okay? Defines a need for accessing the student record, but doesn't say anything about a hyperlink. It doesn't say exactly where you're gonna click. Maybe, maybe the instructor has said, this is exactly what I wanna do. But I'll bet a lot of you out there have had customers say that and then they see it and they go, oh shoot, you know what? I wish we'd have done it this way. Okay, so, you know, even when they're saying this is exactly what I want, I know exactly what I want. We have all been there where once they, we give that exactly to them and they go, oh, well, you know, now that I see it, um, geez, I wish I had done this. Uh, and, and, you know, usually they don't blame you, not always, but usually they don't blame you. But here's the thing, if you give them slices of vertical working functionality, even if it isn't ready to deliver to production re yet, um, it does allow that, that customer, that stakeholder to look at what you've done so far and go, oh, wow, you know what? I see where this is going. Could we think this differently? So uh, let me wrap this whole vertical horizontal thing up. If you slice horizontal, you get debt, okay? You get what we call technical debt. You get stuff that is not done. It started, but it's not done, okay? Debt means, as you see there, debt means that you've done work that is not production quality. It cannot be delivered. A UI that looks beautiful is not production quality because it can't be tested. There's no way to validate that it actually does what it's supposed to do until all the rest of the stuff under it is finished. By the time the customer can see it and provide feedback, you've done a lot of work. And as I've said earlier, what if they, they tell you, hey, I wish you'd have done it this way, or my favorite, oh, you know what? That's actually more than I needed. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> it's already done. Can't undo it. Or if you do, it's going to cost you more. Um, but let's look at vertical slices, okay? The benefits of vertical slicing. If you slice vertically, right, up and down through all the layers, you get demonstrable doneness right away. That's called value, all right? Value means you've gotten work that is now production quality. It may not yet be ready for production. There may not be enough value, but it's demonstrable, it's obvious, it's there. You can see it, you can play with it, you can touch it, and you can get feedback, okay? And when you get that feedback, you'll often discover that it might not be exactly what the customer wanted. Or you might even have the customer say, you know what, that's all I'm gonna need. Even though they asked for more earlier, they look at that and go, you know what? That actually will do what I want. You can stop there. Why don't you move on to something else? I know that sounds rare, but you know what? When you do it this way, when you slice these things really thin, that happens a lot. And the cool thing is you haven't started building it, building that other piece yet. So, so much the better. All right. So let's talk about some slicing approaches. Um, as I said in the beginning of the webinar, there are far more um, uh, approaches to slicing and even topics under the concept of, of user stories than we could possibly talk about in this hour. So I'm just going to pick on a few of the very, very, very common and powerful ones for you to get you started. 
Uh, and I have a little bit of something at the very end uh, too uh, that, that you can go to and take a look at that will give you more. So let's look at these action slicing, data slicing, interface slicing, control, uh, all of these. Very cool, very easy to explain, very powerful because they're very useful. Let's go ahead and take a look at action slicing. So let's start with a user, uh, a user story. As an instructor, I need to be able to see and modify the list of students in my class. So I'm just kind of going to continue with that roster theme. All right, uh, I'm going to get my arrow back here. There we go. So what are the actions that the instructor might want to be able to do? That's This is what action slicing is all about. The instructor said, I need to be able to see and modify the list of students. OK, what does that really mean? Right. Let's talk to the instructor or instructors as a stakeholder group um, and find out what does it mean to see and modify? Because it's never that simple. All right. So I want to view the list. OK, that's pretty straightforward. We got that. I want to access a student record from the list. Oh, is that what you mean by modify? Or maybe that's what you mean by see, right? Because a lot of users, if I can see it, I should be able to open it too. And But they'll, they won't say that. They'll say, I want to see it. I want to view it, OK? Um, I want to be able to drop a student from the list. OK, maybe that's what they mean by modify the list. But hey, if I've got the students listed, why couldn't I be able to drop a student from my class? And hey, as long as I can drop, I want to add. And as long as I can drop and add, hey, what if I just want to drop everybody? We're not, we're not going to run the class, or we're going to move them into another class, and I want to drop everybody. Uh, and of course, then there's my personal favorite because you know people say I want to see the list, and they don't think about the sorting. <laughs> Um, and sorting is a big, uh, that's a whole nother Pandora's box, right? Sort by what? Sort in what order, okay? Um, do you want your sort preferences saved? When you come back to the roster in an hour, do you want to see it the same way you left it, or do you want it back in its default sorting? Who knows? These are all slices of that story on top. So as an instructor, I need to be able to view a list of students in my class. That'll give you the basic list, okay? I want to be able to access a student record from my class list. OK, that's different functionality. I want to drop a student. I want to add a student. You get the idea. And even these could be sliced further using other techniques. All right, and I'm going to show you some of those techniques right now. Um, again, if you've got questions, drop them in the chat for me, all right? Um, all right, got to get the right pointer going on here. Let's go to data slicing. This is also really, really common. As a person desiring education. So in other words, I'm someone, I want to go to that college. Um, so I'm going to uh, apply so that I can take more classes, which is basically what the user story says. As a person desiring education, I want to apply to the college so I can take classes and further my training, my education, my skills. OK, so what are the data elements here that we're talking about? Because we're talking about data slicing. Well, basic demographics. First and last name, OK? I mean, depending on, on what you're doing, your demographics will vary. But I just put some simple ones there. First and last name, age, and date of birth. So in other words, when we're building that student self you know, application process into our college's website, uh, maybe we start with you know, just at that very first vertical slice is you know, they click on the uh, Apply Now. And it comes up with this cool screen and it collects our first and last name, our age and date of birth, or maybe just date of birth, because if you have that, you can figure out the age. Uh, and that's it. Just for now, that's it. We show that to the registrar's office. They're our stakeholder. We show it to them at Sprint Review. And they look at it and they say, where's the rest of the data? And we say, well, we're doing those in separate slices, but we wanted you to get a basic idea, look and feel. Right. That way, if you don't like it, we haven't wasted our time and we can go in the direction you want to go. This is all for you, registrar. Okay, we want to make sure we build, well, there are a million ways we could build this. We want to make sure we build it the way you want us to build it. So here's a, uh, an early look, what do you think? And then we turn around and let's go ahead and grab that address. For those of you that have done anything involving international addresses, you know why I've sliced the address out, okay? Uh, I can't see you, but I bet there's a few people smiling and maybe even nodding. Once you start into international addresses, you're looking at 50 some odd data fields, okay? So <laughs> that by itself, might force you to slice out the addressing. OK, so the next backlog item comes up. And what do we do? We add the student's address. We add fields for the address. And it's not just fields, is it, right? 
We got to validate those fields. We got to make sure that if this is here, this is here. If this isn't here, this isn't here. We got to, they, they have to be independently validated. They have to be validated as a group and they have to get into the database and we have to prove that they're there. There's a lot more than just adding some fields to a screen, right? Because we're doing a vertical slice. This is not just the UI. This is collecting it, checking it, validating it, stuffing it in the database and making sure it's all in the right place and retrievable later. Every single backlog item that's going to happen with. So these are not small, simple. Well, these are small, but they're not all that simple. There's a lot going on. And then of course, we might have to add Canadian addressing, UK, who knows, who knows? I'm just throwing some possibilities in there. Academic history, right? We've got the basic demographics working. The registrar is really happy with what they see right now. And in fact, it's given, some, given them some ideas on what they'd like to see when the student moves on to the academic history, providing their academic history, what now they're thinking what they would like, what, wow, it's, it's not Monday, is it? Now they're thinking what they would like that uh, workflow to look like now that they've seen the demographics. Okay, so now they've got some more ideas, right? They're learning while we're learning. And that's one of the coolest aspects of getting rapid feedback in these very thin stories. Um, so, okay, we got the academic history and they're thrilled and we add the grant and loan and financial aid information that we, that we put in, you get the idea. This is a data sliced story. We've taken the original big story, the epic, and, and now, I mean, you can, you can imagine 10, 20 slices here of various types of data that we can collect uh, as we build up this self-service uh, college application process. All right, let's take a look at another one. I'm gonna leave my arrow there so I can just grab onto it. Come on, Zoom, work with me. There we go, interface slicing. So uh, using the same story, as a person desiring education, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so what are the interfaces? In other words, how might this be accessed? Using a browser? Okay, great, on a Mac or a Windows laptop or desktop, fine. Even within, within that one, you've got Chrome, Firefox, Edge, Safari, uh, different, different computers are gonna display your information differently, okay? Um, and of course, what about the ones that wanna do it on an iPhone or an iPad? They're, they're outside, they just wanna kinda, you know, it's just hit them, right? And you wanna, you, if, you're try, if you're looking for customers and conversions, you wanna get them when it hits them. And if it hits me while well, I've got my iPhone in my hand, wouldn't it be nice to be able to self-register, self-apply? through an iPhone or an Android device. Or maybe I, you know, your, your college is working with another company that gathers these students and gets them to register there and then they pass the information to us. So now it's coming through an affiliate, a different type of interface entirely, what, what in development we call an API connection. Uh, or maybe they have, they just don't have the internet access and they're gonna do it on paper and they're gonna mail it in or drop it off, okay? These are all different ways but that very same functionality might need to be done. And, and yeah, if you're thinking, okay, well, if I combine the data slicing and the interface slicing, that one story is turning into 50 or 60 stories. Yes, it is. Absolutely. And every single one of them will be easy to understand, easy to solve, easy to test, very simple, not terribly complex. And we're going to know with the completion of each and every one of them, even each and each and wow, even if each and every one of them only takes a day or a little bit more than a day to complete, we're gonna know they work, okay? When we go to review, it's gonna work. I mean, we can't control what the stakeholders are gonna say, but hey, we've been giving them so many opportunities for feedback, we might exactly know what they're gonna say, all right? So there's a lot of good reasons for this. Let me go ahead and move on to the next technique, control slicing, all right? I'm gonna stick with the same user story, right? Just give you different ways to slice it down. So here we go. I, I'm going to apply for, uh, I, I want to apply to be a new student. All right. What are the, are the controls or the business rules? All right. Same concept. Uh, you might be a new student, never attended the college, never before applied under the age of 65. Your registration is probably going to be very vanilla, very straightforward. Just go through the steps and you're okay. What if you're a returning student? Attended, but your last class was five years ago. So here you might want to bring up, excuse me a sec, bring up their old record and then let them sort of revise it, okay? So slightly different pathway. Why should they have to re-enter all that information all over again? Uh, a reapplying student applied but never attended. 
Um, so you probably have their information, but and even though they might've been accepted, they never showed up, happens. Or here's another one, a reapplying rejected student. What does that pathway look like? What does that data collection look like? Is there more data we might collect for them? Probably. How about a senior student? How about a veteran? How about a first responder? Okay, there are, it's the same functionality, but there are slightly different flows. If we break them down early, then we can build that simple vanilla flow first, and then everything else after that is basically a modification off of something that already works and the customer already has provided feedback on and we already know they like it. You see how this works? Okay. Let's go to the next one. Risk-based slicing. Not quite as common, but might be not too common because people don't know that it's an option, all right? So let's start with, as an instructor, I wanna be able to remove one or more students from my class. So this is a class roster. Um, so what is the risk we're talking about? Well, the risk we're talking about is that the team, the development team might be concerned about deleting students from a, from a class, dropping students from a class. Uh, and anybody that's ever worked on a, on a delete type function, you know what I mean, okay? Things can happen. Um, particularly when you're doing multiple deletions simultaneously, very convenient but also risky. What if one of the deletes doesn't work? What if the instructor removes a student they didn't want to remove? And I know some of you were thinking, yeah, but you know, that's what, that's what commits and rollbacks are for. Yeah, you and I know that. What's the instructor going to do? Uh, how will they react when they blow away a student that they didn't realize they blew away? And I know some of you have seen this. They try to re-add the student. Great. Now you got a re-add that we're trying to do with, with a where they, they're already enrolled, they got rolled back, and now you get this duplication and it turns into a big mess. Um, what if it fails in the middle of the delete? So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna slice the risk out of the story, okay? So that means two stories. As an instructor, I wanna be able to remove one student, okay? Removing one is risky enough. That means that this more risky story, as an instructor, I wanna be able to remove multiple students, uh, tell you what, we'll learn a little bit about removing students with that first story. And we may even discover that there aren't that many opportunities or reasons to delete multiple students at any time. So, you know, as a product owner, I'm going to say, well, yeah, it's on the list. It's on the product backlog. But you know what? I've deprioritized it for now so that I can get some higher value stuff done. What I'm not telling you is I'm never going to queue this one up from my teams unless it really gets a lot of attention because multiple deletes is just scary. And my team has told me that they're really worried about it. So we're going to slice out the risk. And personally, as a product owner, I'm deprioritizing that risk. I'm going to get it out of my way. Uh, maybe it'll come back. Hey, maybe. If I'm lucky, it won't. So that's what I mean by risk-based slicing. Uh, how about role-based slicing? What if I have a feature that multiple different people need to be able to use? They're probably not all going to look at it the same way. So here we go. Um, as an employee of the college, I want to be able to access a student's grades. Fine. Registrars and admins, they get read access to one student at a time. Instructors, well, that's a little bit more complicated. They get rewrite access to every student in a current class. If the class is already complete, then they can, they can only see it and they can only see students that were in their class. They can't just see any students. Um, there might be a limited group of registrars and administrators that can get read write access, right? Because you want to control those grades. Students, well, they get read access, of course, but only to their grades, right? So there are variations. Now, admittedly, students aren't employees of the college, but I just threw that in there anyway. And then, of course, we've also got the student advisors, right? These are the instructors that have a list of students that are their advisees. So, you know, as a student advisor to a, to, as a instructor who is a student advisor, I need to be able to see their grades, but not everybody's grades, right? So there's a lot of variation on this one. Um, another example that I had, I didn't put it in the slides, but uh, probably a lot of you can relate to it, is let's say you travel a lot and you book airfare a lot, right? So the, the act of booking a, a flight, right? If I'm me and I'm signing on to Expedia or American Airlines or Delta's uh, website, that's one type of functionality. I'm still ending up with a booking, but it looks different 
Then if I happen to be a travel agent, okay, that's booking uh, the same flight, same seat, same me, okay, uh, but they're going to see it differently. Uh, the customer service rep at the help desk at United, they're going to see it differently. Uh, the gate agent, not the gate agent, the ticket agent, uh, when I need to change a flight because it, uh, I don't know, it overbooked or I missed it or something happened, they're going to see something different. It all ends up in a booking, but they all get different versions of it. So that's what you call role-based slicing, all right? Um, I do see a question there in chat. I will go to it, okay, but I want to go ahead and wrap wrap up these pieces. Um, as an instructor, so this is called one zero, a zero one many, okay? Another form of slicing. As an instructor, I need to be able to see and modify the list of students in my class, okay? Remember that one from earlier. Well, let's do the zero. The instructor views the roster for a class with no students. It can't just crash, right? There, there aren't any students in it yet. Um, how about this one? The instructor views the class for, views the roster for class with one student. Um, if I'm viewing the roster for one student, it might actually be easier just open up the student record and say, here's the one student that's in your class, just in case you wanted to see the record. I, I don't know, maybe not. The instructor views a, a roster for a class with 10 students in it. So there's your many. But here's the thing, 10 students I can fit on a screen. What about 100? What about, you know, um, microeconomics 101? <laughs> there's like 400 people in the class in a lecture hall. It's, a, it's the same roster. Do you display it the same way? Or maybe we start paginating, right? So this is another way of slicing user stories down to make them simpler, more usable. Um, I've got two questions here, so I wanna uh, make sure I wrap things up with these. I think that was the last one I wanted to talk about. Uh, yeah, it is. So, um, so tell you what, let me wrap up the slides really quick and then I'm gonna start dealing with any questions that you have. I've given myself 20 minutes, which is not bad. I usually don't have nearly that much time. Um, so as I said earlier, there's a lot we could talk about when it comes to user stories. Um, we've only barely touched the slicing. And what I wanna invite you to do, should you be inclined, um, there is a class that we built on what's called the Artisan Academy. Um, there's a lot of stuff we handle in there. Uh, I'm not gonna make a sales pitch out of this. So I'm doing this really fast because I really wanna get to the questions, but you can see there's a list of stuff there uh, that we cover. Um, there's a link right there to get to it. And I'll leave that there for a couple minutes if you wanna get a screenshot. Uh, we've got a coupon code there that will give you 25% off of that class. Uh, it's about um, two, two, I think it's two more hours of video plus quizzes and a workbook and uh, a lot of information beyond slicing, okay? Uh, we get into writing, we get into managing them, we get into um, cross-cutting concerns, all sorts of stuff, acceptance criteria, success criteria, and so on. Um, now, like I said, I, I don't want to make this a sales pitch. So I'm going to pull this down. I'll put it back up when I'm finished, but I want to start dealing with some of the questions, okay? I've got two of them here, and if anybody has any others, dro drop in, okay? Throw them in there. Uh, so something that you may be able to touch on, in my experience, sometimes you get pushback from folks when wanting to slice user stories vertically, uh, folks just prefer to focus on front end or back end. Yeah, I've seen that many, many times. Uh, the idea of demonstrable production quality functionality is a hard sell. Uh, any suggestions to get the flywheel going in this direction? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I've done with a number of my customers that did the exact same thing, front end, back end, front end, back end, front end, back end, um, is we did it. We Here's what I usually recommend. Almost for any sort of paradigm shifting change, because people don't like change. All right, they'll tell you it won't work before they've even tried it. It's an experiment. We're gonna run an experiment, okay? For the next two or three sprints, now make sure you give yourself enough time because one sprint is enough to make some mistakes. Uh, it's not enough to prove that any, any significant change is really going to work. So give yourself a couple sprints and run a couple experiments. And what I mean by that is let's take a couple backlog items and instead of slicing them front and back end, let's slice them vertically, okay? And let's get a couple people on the front end team and the back end team working together. All right, we don't have to change the team makeup yet. All right, but let's get them working together and just do a couple stories that way. And what you tell them is, look, in the first sprint, we're gonna have to work out the difficulties because we've been doing this front end, back end thing for a while. And it's not gonna just click just because it's a great idea. It doesn't mean it's going to immediately work. So the first sprint or two, that's where we learn what, what aspect of it do we have to change the way we work to make it work better. But if you give yourself a couple sprints, what you're gonna find is you're gonna end up with a bunch of developers going, you know what? 
the communication was better. We were able to work better together. We came up with better integration between the front end and the back end. Uh, we got a lot of the gotchas out of the way that we often experience when they're done in separate teams. But the thing with this, this one is they got to learn it themselves. They have to prove it to themselves. So the real catch here is not trying to convince them it'll work. It's trying to convince them to give it a reasonable shot. Okay, so position it as an experiment, not a permanent change. It's an experiment. And let's give ourselves two, three, four, well, not two, three or four sprints. So at least eight weeks. Okay, so I'm thinking two week sprints. Um, at least eight weeks, two months. Try it out, work through the initial problems, and then make it really work for you. Um, my experience has been so far, except for the organizations that simply do not want to change, which you can't do much about there. Um, that this is something that people really embrace once they see what it can do, okay? Um, so uh, Dave is, oh, hi, Dave. Uh, piggybacking on, um, uh, on um, William's comment, uh, when the vertical slice is very large, so for example, the first story requires a database to be created, connectivity set up, infrastructure. Yeah, uh, in those cases, particularly when you've got long lead items like purchasing and, and set up and networking and firewall changes and all that, you might end up, in fact, slicing out some of the long lead front end stuff. And they're not gonna be vertical stories. They're gonna be big tasks, basically. Um, now, it's very likely that those, um, those pieces can be sliced out into things that can be done uh, in, a, in a sort of a vertical sense. When it comes to specifically databases, because I, I very frequently hear, well, we, yeah, that, that all sounds great with software, but we can't do that with a database. Um, here's what I recommend. There is an absolutely excellent book out there by Scott Ambler on uh, agile database construction. I cannot remember the name of the, the name of the book off the top of my head, but if you look for Scott Ambler, A M B L E R, and I'll tell you what, I'll find it and I'll send it. I'll send the uh, the link to everybody. Uh, Scott does an absolutely amazing job of explaining how to build a database essentially incrementally. Okay, he gets into triggers and views and things that allow you to basically put a front end on your database in, in a sense. And that allows you to make incremental changes. Uh, okay, and when you get to a point where you go, okay, that's what that table's gonna look like. All right, I'm gonna fuse it in there now, like an architecture change. I'm gonna fuse it in there and take off the overlaying uh, structure and voila, I've got the database that I want. Um, so yeah, be careful with that one. I, a lot of people push back, like somehow a database is so different from everything else that we do uh, that it can't be built incrementally. And not only do I, do I differ, I beg to differ with that opinion, I've seen it. Um, and it absolutely can be done in a very incremental fashion that can be extraordinarily helpful. Um, I may have gone too fast. <laughs> I ended a little earlier than I thought I would. Are there any other questions? Um, I mean, those two are great questions. And Dave, I hope I answered yours okay there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what you're pointing out and, and rightly so is that not everything can be sliced vertically, um, but don't, you know, guys don't, oh, hey, Dave, thank you. There you go. Agile based database techniques, effective strategies. That sounds right. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, take a look at that book. Really, really good. Um, I'm not a big fan of Scott's other work, but I got to tell you the database work is really is, is priceless. Um, yeah, anyway, I don't know what I was saying. I lost my train of thought there. Any other questions? Ah, there we go. Uh, hey, Mark, um, what recommendations slash help would you suggest for new product owners on, uh, on to a team around story slicing? Um, well, okay, so uh, not turning it into a sales pitch, the amazing stories class that I just showed you will help um, because it provides a whole bunch of information just like what I just did um, that is going to help you with writing, writing a user story, maintaining the backlog items, and, and, and even uh, ordering your product backlog. Um, what else? What recommendations would you suggest for new product owners on a team around story slicing? Um, around story slicing. Uh, I'll tell you what, um, my, my first exposure to user stories and good ways to slice comes from Mike Cohn. Uh, if you've read User Stories Applied um, and even Agile Estimation and Planning, excellent books, okay? Um, Mike's got three of them out there. The other one I think is called Succeeding with Agile. 
Um, that's less about user stories, more about you know implementation. But those other two books, user stories applied is, is uh, again, I'll use the word priceless. Uh, it's been out there since I think 2004, roughly 2004, uh, and it's definitely worth the money. Uh, I reread it every now and then. Okay. Um, anything else? Yeah, just just uh, you know, let me know. Um, what are some of the tips and tricks to determine a story needs to be sliced? A story needs to be sliced if it, if it takes your team more than three or four days to do it. Okay. Uh, now that's not written anywhere. That's not a you know that's a rule of user stories or it's in Scrum or no it's not. Um, for for the most part. Okay. So I'm I'm throwing you know 35 years of experience at this one now. Um, I haven't I haven't found a situation yet where I wouldn't suggest slicing everything down to no more than about three days of work. Okay, which of course means if it's already a day or two, then leave it alone. It's fine. You know, skip the refinement on that backlog item. It's ready to roll. Uh, but if it's going to take your, your team more than three or four days to build it, it's too big. Make it smaller. Okay. Unfortunately, Scrum says the, the story is small enough, the backlog item is small enough if it fits into the sprint. I could not disagree more. Um, I'm hoping that that got removed from the new Scrum guide. I haven't looked at it yet, um, but well, we'll see. Technical stories versus user stories from Dave. Hi there again. Uh, when you when the user stories are heavily technical, for example, when delving into new technologies, how to get tech folks to think how to slice it vertically? It ain't easy. But um, I uh, the, the conversation I've had with technical folks, uh, including like data research uh, analysts and people like that, uh, is you got to start somewhere. What's the simplest case? What's the simplest condition? What's the easiest version of what you're trying to create? It's kind of like the um, the registration, the, uh, the, the application pathway for the college. Find the vanilla approach, the simplest way to do something, even the heavily technical, right? Uh, I've had the one where, oh, we have to rewrite the entire architecture. Um, well, you know, okay, so when's the earliest we can start to see feedback on it? Well, you know, six months. No, 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 no. There are, there are ways to rebuild your architecture that allow the application on top of it to sit without noticing it. Uh, and there are ways, very similar to what uh, Scott documented in that book, to make modifications to the architecture that are abstracted from the rest of the application. So you can start to see things happening right away. Uh, I had one customer that literally told me, it'll be six months before we know if this is gonna work. And I suggested a change to their approach using what's called an abstraction pattern. Uh, and within a two weeks, they discovered it wasn't gonna perform. So, you know, thank God we didn't put six months into it. Um, but yeah, tech folks, uh, with the tech folks, it's a lot like the database architects. Uh, they look at it and they say, well, my stuff is too complicated. Our stuff is too complex. We cannot do it this way. And the answer is basically the same. You can, you gotta start somewhere. What is that one use case, that, that one scenario? And let's slice that one out and let's start to build it. Will it be perfect? No, it never is. Um, but they, you know what happens is they learn better ways to do it as they go. And before long, the tech folks are telling you how to slice it down. Uh, which is obviously exactly what you want to have happen. Uh, uh, Dana, hi there. Uh, just my opinion. Story slicing is one of the most challenging things to do on a Scrum team. I totally agree. Uh, thus the webinar uh, and and the Amazing Stories product uh, and the fact that I'll probably rerun this webinar a few more times in the next couple months. Uh, I want to try a few more different topics first, but I'll probably rerun it. Uh, and, and also, I forgot, the recording of the whole webinar is going to be on my website tomorrow. I'll, I'll put that link up. You know what? I'll put that link up right now for you. Uh, I'll go back to the Amazing Stories link in just a second. Uh, but let me put this up here for you now while I deal with the rest of these questions. There you go. Um, Tyler, uh, if you have a vertically sliced story, do the horizontal parts typically get created as tasks? Yes, they do. Exactly. So yeah, if you're doing that, um, you know, the, the instructor wants a student roster. And we're on that very first story where all we're going to do is, is drop the uh, student IDs into that first column. Then, yeah, your tasks are going to be things like uh, setting up the search criteria screen so that the uh, instructor can type in the course and section. Uh, or maybe it's a drop down for the instructor. Who knows? Um, and then, you know, an, an, another task is going to set up the screen. Another task is going to grab the data out of the database and so on and so on and so on. Yes, exactly. You build it vertically and you step through the layers with your tasks. Of course, make sure you've got testing tasks for all the development tasks, right? Uh, what else do we have here from John? How do you handle these stories that seemed small enough when you started work, but the work explodes during the implementation? Stop. Okay, as soon as that happens, stop right there in the middle of the sprint, stop. Okay, um, get the team together, look at the story, 
slice off the piece that we know we can do, take the rest of it and just write it up as this story is about all this stuff. Uh, and then when you have an opportunity to do backlog refinement, then you spend time on the, all the rest of the stuff, make it make more sense, slice it down, size it, and then let those pieces roll into future sprints, okay? Do not attempt to go through that entire story in the current sprint. It is not properly planned. It is not properly sized. It is going to cause your sprint to explode. Okay. You don't, it's, it's an avoidable catastrophe. Don't do it. As soon as that happens, slice off the piece, you know, slice out the pieces you don't know, continue the work on the part that you know, and then deal with the rest of it during refinement and planning. Uh, and Mark, how do you dig into mocking and stuff? Would you, would you dig into how mocking and stuff can play into vertical slicing? Uh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're going to build the student roster, right? For the instructor. And let me take a case that probably won't happen, but it might. We don't even have the database tables set up yet. Okay. We, we haven't figured out exactly how we want to set up the database tables. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to build everything in the vertical slice down to the database access. The database access, we're going to do what's called a stub. Okay. Or mock. All right. There's a slight difference, but for our purposes, it's unimportant. The stub or the mock is going to return a data, a record set as if it had come from the database. And we're going to walk that record set right back up to the UI, display it on the screen. We're going to get feedback from the instructors. We're going to get feedback from the stakeholders. We're going to tell them this isn't done. This is stubbed out. This is what it's going to look like. But the thing is, 95% of everything that you did is working exactly the way it's going to work. So when we finally get that database table set up, which might be a couple days from now, it might be next sprint because some other things happened, pull the stub out put the real access in, retest it, and you're done, okay? So yeah, when you do um, slicing, you're probably gonna have to fake it sometimes, okay? Uh, I'll give you another example. Um, one, of the, one of the teams that I ran at Siemens Medical uh, was in systems integration. We did interfaces between systems. And it was often very, very hard to get complete specs from the vendors that we were dealing with. So what we would do is we would create mocked up transactions, mocked up messages. Some of the data would be real, but most of it would be mocked up. And we start sending it out and see what would happen to, on the vendor side. And they'd have all sorts of problems with it. And we'd modify the mock, the, 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 the imitation data, until it worked. And then once we knew how it worked going to them, we knew how to format it coming from us. Uh, so yeah, you pull out the mocks and you drop in the reality, voila, you're back, you're back in business again. Um, so I hope that Mark, Mark, I hope that helps. That might be a great topic for another, another webinar. I really like that topic. <laughs> There's a lot there. Uh, hey, my pleasure. Thank you guys. Um, so I'm going to put this back here. Um, again, I'm, I don't want to turn this into uh, some sort of a sales pitch. It isn't, uh, I just really like talking to all of you and, and sharing some of the, some of my learnings over the years. Uh, if you have any questions about what's on the screen, feel free. If you have any questions about anything, all right, I'm gonna drop it into the chat one more time. Um, oh, I gotta make sure I'm on everyone. Otherwise, just Bailey is gonna hear from me. Um, there you go. There's my user, uh, my email address. Uh, feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, on the artisanandjulia.com website, if you go to the blog uh, and then click on webinars, you're gonna see this recording uh, there by probably midday tomorrow, okay? Uh, other than that, guys, hey, thank you very, very, very much for coming, uh, and look for the next webinar announcement coming out in just a couple of days.